Aloha from Paul Exner aboard the sailing vessel Solstice. I've been sailing for over four decades and have logged tens of thousands of blue water miles while sailing yachts with short-handed crews and single-handedly. Many aboard this boat, Solstice, which are built by hand, a labor of love that began from a bear hull laid up in 1991, 26 years ago. This is the first video of a series to be hosted by me, Paul Exner, that delves into all topics related to ocean sailing in spirit and practicality. From the perspective of a sailing expedition leader with over four decades of avid yachting experience. I'll cover everything from personal safety at sea to the philosophy of seamanship to yacht systems and design and beyond. In this inaugural video, we'll begin with an introduction to personal safety at sea. When it comes to personal safety, you are responsible for yourself, but ultimately it's always the captain's fault. As a skipper, I will do everything within my power to enable the safety of the crew and the vessel. But as an individual, you must take responsibility. It is one hand for the ship and one hand for yourself, or one hand for yourself and one hand for the ship. Because neither can survive on their own. We need the vessel and the vessel needs us. That means maintaining a good attitude, being a good crew member to be around, pitching in where you can, and staying aboard the boat. Should we fall overboard, it's important that we are wearing a personal safety flotation device of some sort. Harnesses that do flotation as well as keep us aboard are very desirable. My preferred device to wear is the Spinlock Deck Vest D5. I find that this is the best, both for ergonomics and features. Inside it is a knife that you can pull out for cutting away any type of tether or rigging that might get around you should you fall in the water. It has a self-inflate with a hydrostatic inflate. It also has a rip cord that you can use right here to self-inflate. Uh, it's equipped with, with reflectors to be seen offshore, self-inflate tube. It even has a light on its own mast that illuminates when it deploys. A spray hood is also included with this unit, which is extremely important because should you fall into the water, you would have your feet dragging you into the wind. The wind would be acting on your, your head and any portion of the flotation device that's above the water and pushing you with the wind and your feet drag behind. So your face is always pointed into the wind. Because of that, you have sea spray and wind just blasting into your face. This unit comes equipped with a face shield. You simply pull it from the device over your head and fasten it. Staying aboard a vessel is paramount to survival. One hand for yourself, one for the ship. I want to talk a little bit about person overboard responsibility for a moment. I've had the unfortunate experience of falling off a boat and being left behind twice. Both of those were on high performance catamarans and race training situations. The first time I went overboard and was left behind, I was single-handed and I was in an inland lake about a mile from shore. There was an equipment failure. The trapeze harness I was using failed and I fell into the water. And the first thing I learned from that experience was, don't ever let go. If you're holding on to something and you fall overboard, don't ever let go of it. In that situation, I fell off the boat and I was holding onto the tiller extension. I fell into the water when the trapeze harness failed and I was dragging behind the boat hanging onto that tiller. The cast, the, the tiller extension bent around the rudder casting and I was dragging behind the boat. I was sailing every day at that point in my life, mostly monohulls, but at that point in time the catamaran with the tiller extension wrapped around the uh, rudders locked the rudders in a straight position and when I let go the boat just took off on its own. I was unable to swim after it. It did not round up into the wind and stop on its own. It continued sailing. Within five minutes, the boat was over the horizon. I was fortunately saved by another vessel that was about a half a mile from me that saw me. 
But upon falling into the water, I had to decide what to do, and it was swimming the survival stroke. I was wearing a, a trapeze harness which constricted my upward mobility. That's why I believe in good ergo ergonomics for equipment is extremely important because you need maneuverability in the water, which is something that the deck vest D5 provides. But I began swimming the survival stroke. Then a motorboat was coming about a half a mile to windward of me, and I was able to use my legs and squirt up into the water and hail them. In that incident, I was not wearing a safety harness such as this one. I was wearing a type 3 personal flotation device which is good for athletic type activities. But offshore I would never wear such a device. I would wear something like this. Second time I went overboard I had the opportunity to hold on and not let go because I remembered that mantra. But what did I do? I let go. But here's the scenario. Here's what was happening. Again we were race training in a high performance catamaran. We were in the Atlantic Ocean off the north coast of Puerto Rico. The boat goes up into a big hike in a, in a puff of wind. I go to ease out the main sheet and I drop the main sheet. The main sheet drops to the deck. Mainsail comes out. I fall to the water. I swing off the back to the boat, suspended by the trapeze harness. I'm dragging behind the boat on the harness, thinking that the boat could capsize to stern as I was dragging in the water. But I decided, because we were race training and my crew was still aboard, in that case I was double-handed, my crew was aboard and I figured if I detached, I could prevent the boat from capsizing and I could simply get back to the boat. So I let go by detaching the harness. The boat came down and my crew, instead of stopping the boat, looked at me with a smile, centered the tiller, sheeted in the main, and gone. I was probably 15 feet from the boat and could have swum for it if the boat was stopped. But they weren't stopped. Again, I failed my mantra, don't ever let go. The situation became grave because as the boat began to accelerate away from me, they were, the crew went for attack. Generally, it takes two people to attack that boat because you have to backwind the jib, reverse the rudders, especially in big seas. Failed the first attack, continued on, failed the second attack, went for a jibe. In that case, in going for the jibe in those windy, puffy conditions, in the jibe, there was slack in the main sheet. The main sheet came down, caught on the, the aft leeward casting of the trampoline, snagged, and capsized. We were separated by probably a quarter of a mile at that point. My crew member did not weigh enough to right the boat on, on his own. It required two people with that amount of crew weight to right the boat. As he was frantically trying to right the boat, with me being separated half a mile, he was drifting away from me in the open Atlantic Ocean faster than I could swim with no chase boats around. I had to make a very grave decision. Swim out toward the Atlantic Ocean or swim to shore for help. I was floating all alone. My crew member was at least fortunate enough to be with a boat that was large enough to be seen. I made a decision to start swimming to shore. But by luck, by grace of Neptune, I, once again I was saved by a passing powerboat that came by and what I did was I raised my hands high in, into the sky on the crests of waves and they saw me, came, rescued me, and we went and recovered the other boat. The lessons to take away from this purely are this mantra, don't ever let go. If you fall into the water and you're able to hold on to anything, hang on to it. Hang on to it if it pulls your arm out of your socket. If you're attached to the, with a tether, even the better. What I can do here is I can clip into a jack line. I can clip into something durable. Don't ever let go. Regarding tethers, this is the one that I prefer. It's a very simple snap shackle type device with a very simple traditional carabiner. For me, this is the best device that you can have. There are other ones available on the market. Mine is a single, but you can also get those that have a single snap shackle and two carabiners. Carabiner styles, styles vary. This carabiner requires you to depress a yellow handle and move in on the, on the mechanism. You'll notice that there's a tooth here. I find that to be a flaw, personally. Sometimes when you're going to detach from something, that tooth hangs up. 
This device also pinches your fingers or the palm of your hand. I don't like it. These traditional carabiners are superior in my opinion. You can do that. You can get it off. You can come up to a jack line. You can do that. You can get it off easily. Look at the tooth. It's smooth. There are even singles on bungees with another type of device. Again, look at the large hook here. Definitely prevents it from coming open, but also is very cumbersome to use as it hangs up. You have to wonder if you struggling to get something off is more a detriment than using something like this that could potentially come open. I don't think this will. I think the human rib cage would crush before something like this came open. When you go to put something like this away, you must put it away consistently because when you need to use it, you want consistency. Where I'm getting at is the tether of this snap shackle on this red bead is open to my right hand. I'm right-handed. If I need to release this snap shackle in a flurry, I'm consistent in the fact that I can grab here and pop it, make it open. So when I go to put this device away, I want to make sure that my red beads are pointed to the right. If you're left-handed, do it left or do it any way you wish as long as it's consistent. The same thing with my carabiner. I hang the carabiner the same way when I go to put this away. When I chose to, to build and own Solstice, I chose this design, the Cape George Cutter 31, for some of the standard features that you have. I built it from a bare hull, but I utilized some of the standard features available because the yard that builds these boats professionally has the molds and the jigs for creating a lot of the things. Although I built everything from the cabin house to the mechanicals, to the rig, to the cockpit combing, to the hatches. Some of the features like the stanchions and the pulpits came from molds and patterns that were available at Cape George Marine Works. One of the features of this boat I really like is the height, the relative height of these lifelines. The bulwark, meaning that the deck is recessed below the shear. That's this area right here. Allows me to brace my foot securely and not slide over the boat. Even if I'm up on the foredeck and I start sliding sideways, I can get my foot into that bulwark and not go overboard. These handholds are very, very secure. Even walking backwards, I'm secure. I would tend to favor handholds over lifelines. Even though those are, these are quite strong, a handhold is something that you can hold on to. I've been aboard boats where lifelines have failed and people have gone overboard. One time in the open Pacific Ocean when I was watch captain and I was responsible for getting that crew member back on board, the lifeline failed. Good handholds offshore are paramount to your survival. Aboard a sailboat offshore, you want to look for handholds anywhere you can to help yourself stay aboard. For example, here, these are hoops that protect the cowl vent from sheets grabbing onto them and throwing, it, throwing the cowl vent overboard. These hoops themselves are made of stainless steel and they, they provide tremendous handholds. In fact, if I felt more secure away from the jack line, I could actually clip in directly here. I'm going to stand up and demonstrate how strong these actually are. You can even stand here on top of uh, the winches. Important. Aboard Solstice, even though she's a 31 foot hull, she has tremendously wide side decks. You want to be careful for vessels that have very, very narrow side decks that force you toward the edge as you're walking from stem to stern. Aboard this boat, I can brace my feet up against the bulwark here with my left foot or the cabin house with my right. And there is tremendous amount of room for being able to walk around. In today's episode, we talked about personal safety and we barely scratched the surface of this topic. There are so many details to cover you about every point that I've made here today and others we didn't even get to cover. 
I assure you that I'm excited and passionate about sharing my vast experience with you in future videos as I've fought hard to succeed in the open ocean and ashore to build my boat solstice and prepare her and many other vessels alike for safe and efficient offshore sailing. I'm very lucky to be here in Hawaii leading incredible sail training expeditions. Hawaii offers diverse and challenging conditions to practice the art of sailing. Everything is possible during my Hawaiian expeditions. From heavy air inter-island passages with epic oceanic waves in the Ali Nui Haha Channel, fueled by accelerating winds down the side of Mauna Kea Volcano at 13,800 feet above sea level. We can even sail along the protected Kona Coast where roadstead anchorages await us, teeming with marine life ranging from whales to turtles to dolphins to manta rays that come visit us on a daily basis. The Hawaiian island chain also provides for dreamy tropical anchorages. We can visit Maui, Lanai, Molokai, Oahu, Kauai. I encourage you to continue tuning into my videos or sail with me aboard Solstice on a Hawaiian expedition. Please feel free to comment on this video so we can begin the discussion. Or check out my website at www.moderngeographic.com. You can also see my posts on Instagram at paul.exner.sailing or check me out on Facebook. Until next time, thank you very much. Fair winds from Paul Exner.